the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, T. Rowe, Price Australia Limited, ABN 13620-668-895, AFSL 503-741, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? It's James Whelan here, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Managing Director as a guest of the Ensemble platform and uh, and welcome as you are. Uh, today we are doing an absolutely special presentation uh, brought to you by T. Rowe Price. It's called The Great Broadening from AI and the MAG7 to Emerging Markets and Beyond. It's an absolute cracking episode that we've got ahead of us, so no more mucking around, let's get straight into it. In over 85 years, we've learned that change is the only constant and curiosity is key. That's why we have over 375 research professionals who go out in the field to get the answers we need. They dig in, studying companies and ideas firsthand, then use these insights to make investing decisions you can feel confident in. T. Rowe Price is a premier global asset management organisation, actively investing in opportunities to help people thrive in an evolving world. Welcome to today's episode of an Ensemble podcast. We're thrilled to have Sam Ruiz, Portfolio Specialist at T. Rowe Price, joining us. In this episode, we dive into the exciting world of artificial intelligence and its growing concentration in the stock market. Sam shares his insights on how AI is shaping investment strategies, its potential risks, and the opportunities it presents for investors. Stick with me. Whether you're a seasoned market watcher or new to investing, this discussion is one you won't want to miss. Special thanks to ChatGPT for helping me craft this introduction. Uh, let's get started. Sam, that, that sounded like garbage. I do apologize for that introduction. I think you understand the, the, the meta of asking ChatGPT to write an introduction about AI and credit itself for writing that introduction. Smoke started coming out of the top of my computer when I actually put that in. So, But Sam Ruiz uh, of T. Rowe Price, how, how are you now? Good, James. That's a good introduction. It was, was <laughs> too to off the bat. <laughs> yeah, see, I, show, showing that humans could probably have just done that straight off. Uh, another example of this one. You don't, you don't need me today. <laughs> Mate, I'll tell you what, one, one, day, one day it's just going to be two AIs talking to each other and they'll put that into a podcast in different voices and, and that'll be it and everyone could just go home. Mate, first off, Sam, um, what do you do and how do you make money? Everyone gets that same question. Yeah, so um, Tiro Price, we've been around since the 30s, so a long time. But um, how we make money, we are around 150 plus analysts and portfolio managers around the world. So we tend to be able to cover markets much broader than your average smaller boutique team. Mm. And how we make money, therefore, is our key edge and advantage is being able to leverage broader insights across the whole market. Um, really relevant to today's discussion, we'll get there. Yeah. But that means that we've got um, analysts covering emerging markets in details, all sectors and sub-industries in much more detail than most. Um, and we think the way to make money, therefore, is being more diversified in where you're positioning your portfolio, not just piling into one theme like AI, which we'll talk about today. Um, and that, for us, we just believe leads to more durable, consistent, repeatable returns in a portfolio versus being levered to one theme when it's in or out of favor. Well, that, that's fantastic. Now, setting the context around what it is that we're going to be talking about today is is to think how bad is it bad is what's going on today? Is is it a real situation? And what could the potential upside or downsides be of that particular situation? How to, how to navigate it, how to avoid it potentially, um, and potentially how to allocate or even just some things to think about to go away with. If we can get to the end of this podcast with that, then there we go. First and foremost, now we're, we're going to get to what AI has sort of become with regards to the difference. And the overarching theme on this one is we've gone from the tell me side of things, and now it's time for companies to go to the show me side of things. Is, is there actual substance behind what it is that they're saying? We'll get to that second. First off, let's just set the scene of, of exactly what has happened to get us to this stage with regards to concentration, size, allocation. Is it justified with regards to how much AI has taken over the, the volume of various markets around the world? Specifically, obviously, I'm referring to the MAG7, but in, in more than just that. Yeah. It's an it open question for you, Sam. I just go. Yeah, it's more than the MAG7. And before I get to that, I'd just say I think um, 
it's taking over a lot of different industries. And there's one particular company that we've held this year that's done really well that you wouldn't think is an AI company, and that's a utility company. Mm. They're providing nuclear energy. Um, what is fascinating, just in the last few days in the press, you'll see that Microsoft just signed a 20-year deal to secure new energy from this utility company. Yeah. They're going to reopen a decommissioned nuclear plant because energy is scarce. We know generative AI is highly energy intensive and a lot of these companies have net zero targets in the future and nuclear is one of the cleanest forms of getting that energy. So, yeah. you see a company like this up around 20% on the day. It was already up something in the order of 50 to 70% on the back of AI and I think it's just fascinating that we're talking about the MAG7, which in a concentration sense have driven the market, but it's proliferating through all these other parts of the market. I've got, I've got a couple of other little places where the, the the second derivative of the artificial intelligence revolution is is going to impact it. The the power one seems relatively obvious and seems relatively easy, which is a good way to make money with the the easy sort of way that it's called. Okay, so, so what sort of concentration are we looking at with, with the MAG-7? Yeah, so when we think about the MAG-7, they pre-generative AI's sort of launch and the reveal to the world, which is the end of 2022, they were circa 10% of the All Country World Index. Now we're talking closer to 20%. Yep. Um, we've seen all of those companies basically expand in terms of their weights in that index. These numbers would be much starker when it comes to the S&P 500. If you were a US manager... Some of these stocks have become so large that your mandate and the rules of how you run your portfolio won't even let you be overweight those companies anymore. So, this shift in index concentration is having very big impacts on not just portfolios, how active managers can even create alpha and even, they're even having to rewrite the rules of how they manage portfolios. One of the biggest, it's, it's probably no surprise to me, our biggest increases has been NVIDIA. Mm. Now, NVIDIA has gone from a company of around $300 billion of market cap to around $3 trillion of market cap since the end of 2022. That's, I'll sort of pause for a moment because you have to let that settle. Yeah. The company is up. A lot of these companies are up because I think you said it's the the tell me, then show me. I think that tell me moment did did result in a little bit of valuation expansion for some of these companies. Yes, they have become a little more expensive, some of them a lot more expensive versus the market and versus their own history. But if we think about a company like NVIDIA, which has been one of the biggest increases in index weights, it's grown its earnings by more than 600% over that period of time. So, if I can tell you there's a company that's going to grow their earnings over 600% in a sort of 18 to 24 month period, you're probably expecting the, the company's up some. But I think, I think it was a really prudent way that you laid that out. It was this innovation that had all these great headlines of how it's going to change the world, improve productivity. Some even saying it might fix the inflation problem due to this increase in productivity. But now the the biggest buzzword when it comes into anyone, what we do when it's like deep in markets is ROI, return on investment. Yeah. It's, it's, is this actually going to meaningfully be able to be monetized and create profits for companies? Because if it doesn't, and if the cost of actually utilizing these models is too high, then we're probably not going to see these earnings and cash flows come through that the market was predicting. Yeah. And then the valuations become more vulnerable around that. And I yeah. think we're right at the epicenter of that debate right now. Do you think, and, and what's what's the call sort of being made just with some of the, maybe, maybe in, NVIDIA is a different one because they are right on the, on the, they actually have a tangible good that sort of comes out that, that, that they can have. There's a number of chips that they have that slot into the number of servers and the number of servers. You can sort of predict how many things there's going to be. Um, the idea of nuclear power being able to uh, more switch, like switch on Three Mile Island, and then you can power Microsoft's data centers makes it very easy to then all of a sudden start to value these sorts of things. If that's now becoming more popular, what about some of the other ones? Mm. Though, I mean, does does I mean Meta? Is there enough of a a show me situation behind Meta being able to utilize AI for what it does? I mean, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Meta is. Um, I'll I'll give you a little a couple of little stats. Here. Yeah, go go for it. That's right. I don't so, know you've got yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in in this. AI boom, we'll call it the AI boom, and a lot of people say the AI hype, but I think there's genuine profits and excitement behind it, so I'll call it the AI boom. We've seen those MAG7 companies have earnings growth in 2024 that was 47% greater than the rest of the S&P 500. Okay. Now, when we fast forward to next year, just as a little bit of a point as well, we're only expecting that to be around 5%. So, something's changing. They're, they're becoming less good, but there was a big boom that did happen, and it was genuine earnings growth. 
And Meta is a great example because Meta has surprised everyone in their ability to use AI and all the technology that they've built to improve the way that they generate um, ad recommendations. If you're a seller basically advertising on any of Meta's products, whether it's Facebook or Instagram, Mm. you want to get solid data that your ad has actually targeted the right consumer and the conversion rate of them actually buying something from your ad is high. Now, if I backpedal a little bit, Apple has had a privacy campaign And they've really tried to sell themselves at this product where we're not going to let other people get your data if you buy an Apple product. Mm. They actually previously would allow companies like Edda, um, Meta, to get your user data from your phone via a unique identifier that was in your phone. They turned that off. That was turned off, which means Meta no longer got the signal of what you were doing on your iPhone. And they had to somehow scramble to say, we had this great customized advertising tool because we knew what you were doing in your iPhone. Yeah. Now, we have to figure out a way to get AI to go and piece that all together without any data from Apple. Now, that's a huge job. That's incredibly hard. And there's been a lot of anecdotes and stories. You've probably had them yourselves where people are going like, we've just had a baby. My wife's talking about what pram we we want. And all of a sudden, I'm getting pram recommendations two hours later. Yeah. How did that happen? I can tell you how it happens, but okay. Well, you you can tell me how it happens. I can can, can tell you how it happens, but I don't think I'd make it home tonight. It's okay. Yeah, (laughs) of course. They have, and in the last earnings result, shown tangible evidence that their AI has been able to fix that problem and they're seeing much more cut through and more meaningful recommendations and better sell through and targeted advertising. The algorithm is working incredibly well and we have been surprised at how much they've been able to sustain the high level of earnings growth. Um, At the same time, they've actually been reducing their cost base and cutting headcount. So, that example doesn't exist for everyone. I've honed in there because you did say Meta as an example. Yeah, yeah. Do they benefit from AI? But I think you very astutely narrowed on Meta because while NVIDIA sells the chips, the other companies that are basically benefiting from the rest of the world wanting to use AI are Google, Microsoft, and Amazon because they are what we call these hyperscalers that are building these massive industrial-sized data centers mm-hmm. where they're putting all these NVIDIA chips in. And if you... If any one of us here has a great idea of some way you can leverage generative AI, you can basically then go and rent some of those chips off those hyperscalers and mm-hmm. train a model using their models also. Mm-hmm. And that that has actually been something that we're already seeing come through in the numbers for Microsoft's Azure, for Amazon's AWS, and Google has a division GCP, where we are seeing an uptick in the utilization of the cloud data centers specifically for AI. So, it is already happening, um, but then there's... We can probably go deeper into Microsoft Copile and other things. There's a bit more of a show me that we haven't seen yet. Well, I mean, we we might get down there later on as as we go. So, uh, but we've mentioned okay. So there's justification behind the valuations. There's valuations that are based on earnings growth. Earnings growth is there. We've got the the, the perfect trilogy. Everything keeps on going. I'll, I'll cut you off for a moment because I I think that the justification around uh, very- valuation yeah is something that's hotly contested and debated today. So. I don't know I if you jumped, want to go I jumped ahead. No, go yeah. for it because that's what I want to talk about because we're going to talk about the, the, that there's concentration. We're going to talk about the valuations. People always look at vowels and just go, oh, it's unjustified. And a lot of the time, the, the valuation is just for things that you haven't actually put into account yet or stuff that hasn't even been thought about being priced in yet, i.e. most of what Kathy Wood did during the early 2020s. So, go for valuation. I, I want to hear your thoughts on, on where you see this. Yeah. So, the companies um, have wide-ranging valuations at the moment. We would actually make the case that we've probably seen the best of some of the initial sort of AI translation to earnings and yep. some of the valuation that's been put on that. And from here, we think that that's going to dissipate and the market's going to broaden somewhat. And there's a whole second order bunch of ramifications from that and how advisors choose funds and index funds. And um, I think people need to really keep their hand on their back pocket in terms of how you want to position for this next phase of the market. Yep. But one example is NVIDIA. Now, NVIDIA's earnings multiple doesn't look egregious. But when you start to look at the company on revenue multiples, it starts to look a bit more expensive and a bit more concerning. Now, that might be a lot for people that aren't in markets every day to understand that. But a way I'll dumb that down is NVIDIA is currently earning, it's a cyclical company, but unsustainably high operating margins because there is no true competitor There is an arms race basically climbing over each other to get access to these chips. 
Yeah. Whether it's because they think they can monetize it or whether it's they think that it is imperative for future competition that they access this. Otherwise, they might be competed in ways they haven't before. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very unlikely that NVIDIA can continue to earn those 70 to 80% operating margins, which means- Sorry, 70 to 80% operating margins. I, I, I myself had no idea they were that high. They are, and I've, I've, I've owned this stock on and off for the last few years. They have, yeah. they have, it's no surprise that companies doing well because they're selling everything they can and they're sold out. To, to you know, very big customers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so a company like a- AMD, for example, which is working really quickly to have a competing GPU, you've got the hyperscalers themselves are either funding competitors so that they can come up with a, a true comp- competitive chip faster, or they're even developing them in house themselves. Yes. Yes. At some point, when that competition comes online, and every quarter we get closer to that competition being realised. NVIDIA is not going to be able to earn those same margins in the future. And that just means that that's the distinction between when you look at cyclical stocks that are making unsustainable, unsustainably high margins, and we call that they're in a period of over-earning, that when you look at them on revenue multiples, they're actually not as cheap. And NVIDIA is just one that we would say we think that the capex that's being spent through NVIDIA is actually peaking or has already peaked yep. in terms of the percentage growth rates. And from here, you need to be a lot more discerning. So, we've actually reduced our NVIDIA. It's our largest underweight of the MAG7, um, which wasn't the case three or four months ago. I can imagine. Um, so, if for an advisor who's doing a little bit of homework on this one, then you want to have a look at some of the research. You want to have a look at some of the margin expectations over the next few years just to justify um, or to, to just to back up what it is that you said. Correct. Margin contractions, in my experience, a margin contraction is, is a bit of a death rattle for a company. Um, maybe not necessarily a company like NVIDIA, but- Something that has run so hard, yeah, I can I can see the justification for where you'd how you'd want to be still exposed, but not as not as not as heavy into that one. Correct. Also, the the other case is that if you've got the other people that are in the market, now we're talking about we, we've gone through the concentration that's that's in the top end, justification, valuations, earnings versus revenue multiples, and what's going forward on that one. Let's now talk about what happens when a whole heap of money, and we saw this happen at the beginning of August. Um, temporarily, and then everyone got everyone got distracted by some stuff out of the Bank of Japan. We saw, which I'm not going to talk about because that was an ugly couple of days for everyone involved. But the we saw the market suddenly start to rotate from that big end into small caps, with the expectation being that the Fed is going to start cutting rates. The big end of town has has definitely peaked. We've taken a lot of the money out uh, that, that we've got on that. We've got profits to lock in at this particular stage. Let's go into small caps now because they are deeply, deeply undervalued. They were the, one of the worst performing asset classes or what was sectors, if you want to call them a sector, whatever, of the year before. Okay, let's charge in. It was almost instantaneous the way that happened. How much of it is, it, is a drop in the ocean for a MAG7 investment suddenly when it goes to a small caps? What are the ramifications of that as, as everyone sort of rushes into, into trying to jump onto the same small boat? Yeah, I mean, I think the the delta or the impact's going to be much larger for the small caps because when you've got just by virtue of their market caps, that amount of money that's flowing is just going to see them move much higher, much faster. Yeah. And this is where it is a really hard thing to triangulate when you're an asset manager, when you're an advisor and you're thinking about these mag seven, where I've kind of painted this picture up until now that AI has benefited them hugely. They've done really well, but a lot of it's deserved. But maybe you need to be more cautious going forward. But this isn't a binary thing of the Magnificent Seven stocks are good or bad. The hard thing you have to think about today, and I'll get to your question. Yeah, yeah. I really want to make the point that they are not bad stocks. And it is really dangerous to bet against them in a big way. What I would just say is it's not the time right now to be backing up the truck and loading up on MAG7 given where we are yep. in terms of the the future of earnings and where some of the multiples are yep. in terms of valuation. Did you want to use the term relative valuation on this one or are you going to just going to- In terms of them versus the rest of the market? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think they're, they're actually driving the rest of the market higher. So, in terms of relative valuations, they're probably even higher than their own absolute okay. history. Good. But when we think about how these companies are positioned, you have to recognize that most of them, and I think the Magnificent Seven tagline is going to go away at some point because it's not really- the same anymore and Tesla's a different company the rest and benefiting from different things but what I'd say is that this group of companies are quasi monopolies in their own space and that's really dangerous to bet against they are also funding a lot of this AI growth 
from free cash flow, not from debt. Yep. And what was bad about the late 90s with the fiber build out and the dot com bubble was it was a lot of debt fueled spending that when the demand in the end of the day wasn't there, they effectively went bankrupt. Yep. Now, what you have is the scenario where investors have to realize if these companies are spending a lot of capex to build out the AI infrastructure. Now, Microsoft's an example, not to get too technical again, but is actually kind of expe- expensive on earnings. It's around 30 times forward earnings, yeah. but it's even more expensive now on free cash flow because of the capex they're spending to build out the AI capacity okay. in terms of data centers. Okay. And then all of a sudden, if Microsoft goes, oh my goodness, the demand for our Azure, which is our data center AI training model business cloud there, thing. cloud yeah. effectively, yeah. if the demand for Copilot isn't there, we can just rationalize all this spend. We can just let all that money we were spending in CapEx come back to investors as more free cash flow. Yeah. And you're just going to see the stock all of a sudden get really cheap again on free cash flow and the stock would move again. Yeah. So, it's really hard to bet against companies where they effectively have their own future in their own hands and they can really quickly hand money back to investors if AI is not a good use of capital. Yeah. So, I really wanted to, to distinguish that. Got it. wouldn't be betting against them in a big way, but- Nor are we recommending- did anyone do that? I, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm on the record with this one as well. There's yeah. Diff- there's a difference between underweighting, rotating, and actively just going against these things. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, Good. So, so, to your question, which was a very long ra- round trip to get there. but hey, it's a podcast, man. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Investors need to be thinking about this was one of the best periods that I can think of for passive investing, which is the point you made. These, these stocks became larger in the index, which meant that the things that were working were disproportionately adding more value to the index. Yeah. And there were some funds out there that really overexposed their portfolios to, to these companies. I saw um, one manager, not from T. Rowe Price, has an emerging markets fund. And in that emerging markets fund in the top 10 were NVIDIA, yeah. ASML, and Broadcom. Okay. None of them are in emerging markets. I'm sure you can build a case that they sell somewhere into emerging markets. But there was a lot of crowding and rushing by active managers that had looser mandates to really load the truck up on some of these things. I was, on yeah. that point, I would just say, as an advisor, you need to... I think one of the best questions you can ask any of your fund managers is over the last two years, what was the contribution or the attribution in terms of the excess return just from a select group of AI stocks and mega caps. Because if this manager all of a sudden has, you know, 10% outperformance or something, you then need to say, if AI was like just a very narrow one-time huge boom, are they going to be able to pivot to the next thing that's going to add that same value or were they, did they just get lucky and load up on the AI stuff? Uh, yeah, bull markets make a lot of people smart, don't they? In but- hindsight, they do. Yeah. Uh, and And... and, and and the other side, which is where we're more focused now, I think is going to be much tougher and more bro- and broader. But one one interesting thing that stood out to me, we, we have um, clients in Australia that range from small financial planning firms to larger small financial planning firms, all the way up to multi-billion dollar mandates with industry super funds. And one thing that stood out to us that just was a penny drop moment of how these the indexation dynamics was driving these stocks further, some crowding from active managers was driving these stocks further. But if you were an institutional markets participant, now a lot of people are probably aware of the legislation in Australia called Your Future, Your Super, and it's requiring the industry super funds to have much tighter risk budgets. Mm. And if they have a whole bunch of active managers saying, we don't like Apple, for example, because Apple's a slow growth company on a high multiple and we don't think that it can go up much from here, they were actively covering other managers' underweights by buying those stocks themselves so that their net position wasn't underweight. Now, that means that you have this dynamic where there's a huge raft of huge pension or huge amounts of pension money globally basically saying, we can't afford the risk of being underweight and if our active managers don't own them, we're going to go rush and buy them ourselves. And that was another sort of circular force that was pushing these stocks higher and forcing money into these stocks. And I think that's sort of on the cusp of changing now. Okay. That's, well, that is a whole different kettle of fish to go down that. Now, we started going down this road, so I don't want to go down that. We could talk about the super industry in this country, but that's probably for a whole different other bunch of podcasts. So, we kicked off the podcast talking about nuclear technology powering data centers and maybe some of the second order, where, and, and, and you just touched on some of the second order stuff that, uh, that there is out there as well. One of the examples that I've got, and this is, if you want to talk about micro caps, micro caps. So I was at a mining conference the other day, 
Um, and I, I didn't even think about this. It's one of those things. Critical minerals is my thing. I love, I, I love the space. Um, I think it's good. It's hot. China's doing a lot of work in it. Europe's just put together a, a, a package on critical minerals. We have a lot of the critical minerals here as well, so it's great for this country. It's, it was a gallium company. and We're talking micro cap. Like you and I could shake the tin down at Ryan's Bar and be able to buy this company a, a, a few times over. But it's a gallium company that had holdings in Arizona that apparently gallium makes things go faster without getting too detailed on the thing. Things go faster inside the AI um, technology. It makes the circuits go faster. If you put gallium in there, it makes it run faster, quicker AI, quicker regen, quicker functions, quicker everything. You need gallium, and gallium is a really rare critical mineral. So that's that's like a, a derivative of a derivative all the way through through there. But that's the sort of thing where you need to find it. Th- those little chestnuts are going to be out there. Nuclear is the obvious one, which is there. Parking your data center right next to a nuclear power plant is a pretty obvious sort of thing. Maybe not building a nuclear power plant next to your data center, not not the way to go. What are some other um, some other second derivatives that are out there that you could say? Yeah, I mean, there are many, um, and they're not all in the US, and they're not all, all mega cap. We've been playing some, like one technology is called hybrid bonding, which is, to your point, when there's yes. scarcity of computing power and GPUs, and everyone basically is competing to have the best high-powered um, AI technology or infrastructure, hybrid bonding basically means that we can stack various um, chips closer together, which means that the throughput, the connectivity and the speed at which it talks to each other, you can get more in a tighter space and get it talking together faster. Got it. Kind of similar to your Gallium example. Um, There's a whole bunch of other things like testing technology where if we're going to be doing hybrid bonding, there's new laser technologies, um, particularly in Japan, that can see through multiple layers. So, you can test as the technology moves to stacking of chips. You can do all the testing you need to do. Yep. Um, there's cooling. So, these are in te- el- el- energy intensive, but they're also very hot, these new generative AI stacks in the data centers. So, there's companies that provide water cooling, which is a better technology and also cleaner yep. to keep them. Um, everything from that to just very simple copper connecting circuits um, from very traditional sort of electrical component companies. So, it's wide ranging in that in that sense. But what I'd say is we actually don't believe that we're in this zone where the market's going to broaden from mag seven towards the second or third derivatives. What I would just call out is the magnificent seven. We've talked about why they've done so well because of earnings growth that's really pushed them there. But what we haven't talked about is that there hasn't really been much else in the market to invest in. So it's like in a relative sense, if you're an investor, you're not putting your money in Chinese tech because China has been an unmitigated disaster and you don't know how to think about Tell what about. the government's doing, yeah. except for yesterday there was a stimulus package that some are calling the final moment where they're going to come to the market. I got that so wrong too. I don't really want to think about it. Yeah. It doesn't even bear on thinking about it. But my, it's, yeah, it's, 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 I told you some of my PA personal stocks. <laughs> it's extraordinarily, China, you, it's extraordinarily yeah. bullish for China. But if I had a dollar for every time that I said, okay, that's the bottom in China, Correct. We'd, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be having this conversation on a boat. Exactly. Uh, um, so, if you think about regionally, like there's a handful of countries, but US is one of the only countries that's outperformed um, through this narrow market that we've had. Um, fun fact, India actually has as well because people are super down on emerging markets, but yep. it's it's a lot of the China cloud is what's made EM bad. When we think about um, other areas though, I think it's fascinating. Consumer staples, originally they were weak because some of the, they don't have as much pricing power um, in terms of being able to really elevate prices and the raw input costs were really high because of supply chains, which hurt margins. Then all of a sudden, GLP-1s threatened that people aren't going to consume as many potato chips or other calorie. So, that put a bit of an overhang on these consumer staple stocks like ResMed. Yep. You have a whole raft of financials. Credit looked bad and people were worried about their exposure to commercial real estate. Real estate, you have not just the commercial real estate issues, but both real estate and utilities tend to be disadvantaged by interest rates actually being too high. I can run through a whole bunch of other sectors, yep. but- there's been a bunch of things that have gone wrong for the rest of the market at the same time that AI has been really good. And we just think that that's flipping now. US rate cuts, we've got some things like the weakness in industrial production in the US means the economy can reaccelerate. Mm-hmm. We just think that while the MAG7 won't be as amazing but not terrible, this whole other section of the market that was bad for so long is actually on the cusp of starting to do better now and there's other areas you can make money from. Are you seeing any particular areas that are utilizing artificial intelligence to be able to increase or be able to sustain their margins? Now, this is a, a big investment theme of mine. 
take for example John Deere. Um, you know, that people see it as just being a simple tractor company. If it's like if you knew what they did, that's an AI company. That's that that is a that is a tech stock. Yeah. Um, anything that's in that sort of area of people who, who are being able to utilize now that the we've gone for the tell me now it's the show me and now other companies are going into the utilization side of things. I think that we're incredibly early in the utilization side. There's not a lot of evidence, frankly. Um, it is one of the most hotly contested things that we debate internally. Go. And there's some some bulls and bears on both sides of it. Yeah. There are examples like um, Microsoft owns a company called GitHub, which does coding. Coding was something that if you came out of university, you'd be on a $200,000 plus salary all of a sudden overnight using OpenAI's technology that Microsoft effectively purchased. You can have a coder being 50% more productive overnight. The code just starts to fill itself out. Yep. Chatbots for this, like a, a company called Teleperformance in Europe that was down a lot because all of a sudden companies were introducing this AI-generated chatbots that were making the response times to customers way faster, et cetera. So, there's going to be some niche areas that are coming through. Copilot from Microsoft is one um, that I think it's in the show me camp but has the potential to, to add a lot of value. Let's go down that because you've mentioned it a few times. And I, it, it seems like if you mention something four times, then you must be keen to talk about it. How does Copilot change the change the game? What is, what's, what's special about this particular one? I think Copilot... The, the jury's out whether it entirely changes the game. But effectively, if we were all right now doing this on Teams, um, you can then just say to Copilot, I can see you shaking the head. I'm, I'm a Zoom. My preference is Zoom. I don't know about you, but... Um, I'm, a, I'm a Zoom guy. I, we use Google and that's it. But you know that my, my personal theory is that COVID was started by Microsoft to get people to use Teams, right? I uh, I wouldn't put a pass. I wish you told me that before I invested in Zoom. <laughs> I think, I think my, my my position was down about eighty percent before I realised it's going to get disrupted. But um, anyway, but you can basically type in and say, I want you to publish the minutes of this call. I want you to allocate the action items. I want you to email each person two days before their action items are due, and I want you to put that in a board memo paper and send everyone invites to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would take someone time, and that's something that now the AI basically can go and do for you. If you're in PowerPoint basically saying, I want you to reorganize all this to make, make it look pretty, I want you to make this in my corporate template, and then no more than six dot points per slide, go. And then the thing that's really powerful with generative AI is – it's iterative and you can talk to it like a human. So, and you don't have to be too kind. <laughs> you I always say, ask, please. I ask, please. When I, when I did this on ChatGPT, I, I always say, please. It's, it's, uh, they'll thank me. You're, they, not, you're nicer than me. I'll be the last, I'll be the last, <laughs> I'll be the last one wiped out. You did too. <laughs> Kieran Ari, our producer, is nodding his head too. Um, when, the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the robot revolution comes, I want to be one of the last ones. That's a whole other topic. I mean, that, that's all. <laughs> Elon Musk's his, his robot um, venture and why he thinks aging demographics, we're gonna, all going to have robots everywhere is a yeah. whole other thing. But um, so anyway, like, that, that's, that's like a really smart Clippy. Yeah. It, Do you remember Clippy? I don't remember Clippy, no. How old are you? Uh, yeah, so of that. Can I say that? No, Clippy, <laughs> Clippy, Clippy was a thing that popped up in Microsoft Word yeah. and, and, other, and other Microsoft documents. It was part of the Office package. He just popped up and was just like, and this is the, the if, if you wrote D something, it would pop up on the side. Yeah. And it was shaped like a paperclip and he was yeah. called Clippy. Yeah. And it, was, it looks like you're writing a letter. Do you need help? Yeah. And you go, yes. Oh, yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. And, then, and then it would then proceed to not help you at all yes. through, your, through your path, right? Yeah. That was so, so this, <laughs> this, this is supposed to be a lot better than clipping. Um, but I think that <laughs> I think that when you look at Microsoft and how you think about it as an investment opportunity, yeah. you have to believe that there's going to be a very big uptake of people around the world paying an extra $30 a month. I would this, do that. For this service. Yep. Um, and I, I've got no doubt it's going to get better than where it is today, but it's not perfect. And as an example, all those great scenarios I gave you of how you can use it now or hopefully in the future, I had had these visions of if someone sends me a million rows of data in a spreadsheet, I don't have even know, have to do it, know how to do a regression analysis or anything. I can just say, go do this and generate five amazing um charts with the most powerful data and write me an analysis whereas we're finding out now that the data has to be perfectly organized into a perfect pivot table otherwise it can't organize it and so it's not perfect but um anyway that, that's a use case so that's going to make people more efficient um, yeah 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 and it's 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 the training and utilization of a company like mine so for example i didn't know that those things were uh, were there i'm still i'll tell you what i've got i've got a, i've got an office admin who i think has potentially been using it and using it quite successfully and i think that she's amazing yeah and maybe th there is no difference. There's no difference between her being amazing because she can reformat these documents for me that I can't do mm. or if she's just getting something else to, to do it for her and handing it back to me and making it look like it's her own work. I've got, I don't care. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. So, we, yeah. I think that companies, companies do need to utilize these things better because we just don't even know what, what these things are. Yeah. Um, and we do it We do it ourselves. We have um, decades of research analysis and notes and minutes from our meetings with CEOs all in this big research management system. And we've developed our own internal model where I can basically say, um, tell me the thesis for Amazon, how that's changed over the last three years, and tell me what the key revenue generator of Amazon is today. That would have taken me four hours to go through various meeting notes in the past, and now it's just going to summarize it for me. And then if I say, wow, that's really complex, I'll say, dumb it down and tell me in layman's terms, and then it just does that for me. That's perfect. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. That's, yeah. the, that's the way that the future is supposed to go. And all of those things require across, you know, you need Microsoft, you need the data that's behind it, potentially yeah. your own internal things, the 8,000 companies that all work together to be able to build that for you. Half of them listed, half of them t- about to be bought, or or all listed in there as well. Mm. There is obviously a future that is uh, that is to be dominated in this side. And I'll, I'll give you a point that I think some people don't recognise. I don't entirely buy into this. You said at the beginning, small caps are super cheap. There's a big mean reversion event happening, and it's time to to load up on small caps. Mm. One thing I think some people miss is what do large companies have? They've got history. Yeah. And they've invested and they've got, typically got large customer bases and they've typically got a lot of data. If you're a small company that's been around for three years and you haven't had a huge team basically putting all this stuff in the cloud and generating data, you are at a distinct advantage to a large company that can compete with you utilizing AI. Yeah. I don't think AI is going to actually be able to be utilized as much. This is a very generalized comment no, no, it's, by it's, some of these small companies. And I mean, how aggressively those big companies can can protect their moat as well is, Correct. is is phenomenal Yeah, to be able to do that. So until, and what is it, uh, one of those, a, a bit of a futurist actually was saying that until there's a time when everything doesn't flow through that very small handful of companies, then it's the, the, the norm will probably stay. Yeah. Well, I think that we're about out of time here. Sam, we've got anything else to go over? I mean, I just want to emphasize that a lot of this AI stuff is known. A lot of this AI stuff, which is a technical term, yeah. has driven the market and if we look at since ChatGPT was announced to the rotation, we actually already started to see on the 10th of July, the MAG7 outperformed the rest of the US market by 115%. Yep. Since the 10th of July, they've underperformed in general by around 12%. There's only one company that's outperformed since that point. It's Meta. Yep. And it comes back to how we actually think that's the one standout company driving better return on investment from AI. But then if we're right and the market continues to broaden from here, I think investors need to not just think about how much of this big AI mega cap exposure they have in index funds or with some managers that maybe have really loaded up on the stuff. It's about how big changes and big changes tend to drive big um, variations in the market will mean something for the future. One big change happening right now, the US Fed obviously is just cut by 50 and yep. is likely going to go go for more. Yep. What does rate cuts mean? Well, it is a point you did mention, but it means that for some of the smaller companies out there that rely on capital, that's going to become cheaper for them and that investment moat can start effectively um, starting off again. Emerging markets is a really big one that has been under the cloud of China. And a lot of these EM countries, without getting into the detail, have to fight against high US rates with their own high rates and inflation, which really hurts consumption. Yep. And we think that's set to improve from here. You've got potential opportunities like China, if this stimulus is real, helping not just China and other parts of Asia, but some Western economies like Germany that rely a lot on Chinese demand and the commodity complex in general. I think it's really interesting that we're talking about weakness in energy prices, a lot of it funneled through or because of Chinese demand being weak at a time when we have war breaking out more than is comfortable, much more than is comfortable. And more, than, more than one war in that region is probably more than I could uh, more than I could handle. Yeah, correct. And and typically this is something that requires a premium for commodities. You've got other parts of which it might sound a little bit early, but lower rates in the US is actually good for some banking stocks. If this if we are truly heading towards a soft landing, and there isn't a credit problem, which we fundamentally think credit is quite healthy in the US, you've got banks now. This is something that I, as a mortgage holder in Australia, hate to stomach, but people in the US still have these three odd percent 30-year mortgage rates. Yep. Um, we yep. can lock it in maybe at four, if you're lucky, where some banks actually are going to see net interest margin expansion because if those low interest rates that they're lending out for are locked in, all of a sudden, finally, lower rates means that they're paying less to depositors and that, rec- that means net interest margin expansion. Mm-hmm. 
that should also, the lower rates, potentially spur some of the activity in the US economy. We've seen industrial data actually be in contraction for a number of quarters now. Yep. And there's parts of the economy you wouldn't think, like very simple, durable businesses in areas like logistics. This is sending freight on trucks and trains that have been very weak because of that activity being low. These types of things we think have been bad. It's funneled more money into the MAG-7. It's focused more attention on AI and the MAG-7. But now we think we're on the cusp of, and we are already seeing it, more more tailwinds hitting the rest of the market. Hence why, and it's a, it's a point I made earlier, yep. why the market consensus is already predicting what was a 47% premium of MAG-7 earnings growth versus the rest of the market is contracting to only 5% next year. Okay. So, that, so it, say that again. A 47% premium of earnings growth over the rest of the market will now only be a 5%. Is that because the rest of the market is going to be picking itself up? Or just the, the, the both the crocodile... I'm doing it. I'm doing a thing like that. The crocodile jaws close together. Both, it's both, both, you're so, exactly yeah, right. So yeah. both jaws are, are moving. So the the earnings growth of Mag Seven has peaked and is contracting. So that's the top jaw coming down. Yeah. And for the what we call the S and P four hundred and ninety three. So the next companies the below other, the Mag Seven yeah. in the S and P five hundred actually had five sequential quarters in a row of negative earnings growth. And the last earnings season we just had was the first quarter of earnings positive growth for that subset. And that's going to be improving from here. I mean, if if you look at the three, or just I've picked three examples out, and I can put a justification. I can put a thesis. You don't need an AI to be able to do this, right? You want to talk about transport? You talk about diesel costs being being way down, right? That helps transportation companies. Fantastic. You got to talk about rates coming down. All of a sudden, that family that has been sitting on this house, just going, "We have outgrown this house, but we can't move because we cannot refinance. We can't get more money. We've got to sit here with our thirty year loan." All of a sudden, maybe four percent is going to be that isn't that much of a stretch. Spot we can, on. We can refinance. We can get a bigger house. That helps your home depots. It helps your property. It helps all of those things underlying it as well. Finally, consumer discretionary, straight out of the box, right? Um, and that was immediately as soon as that. that there's more equity in homes um, than for a very long time, potentially ever. I think someone was saying consumer discretionary came straight, straight out of the box. So like rate cuts, bang, and you can see that that's that's impacted it as well. You don't need AI for me to tell you that. And I'm not a guy who's right on the cutting edge of those markets anymore. Pretty easy to see that there is going to be a dispersion. What are we going to call it? I think we call it the great broadening. I like it. <laughs> great broadening. On that note, Sam, I think that we're about done. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Sam Ruiz, uh, investment specialist at T. Rowe Price. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, James. Great to be here.